I'm not Anthony Parrott or Brennan Cook. Uh, I'm also not Steve Petty, some of the pastors that we have on staff here. Um, I am Ryan Cunningham, and I'm part of something that's called the teaching team. Um, it's a new concept, uh, something that uh, Good News really has lifted up for quite some time, but uh, there's been a team of us that are meeting, and, and we're really looking to say, you know, how is God using us and wanting to use us uh, in the realm of teaching? Uh, that may mean coming up here and, and giving a message. That may mean something different uh, for each of us, but it's pretty awesome that Good News says we've got awesome pastors who give a great message who are willing to give up a little of what they love to do so that the message of God can come through us and the body of Christ can be lifted up. This last week, uh, a number of us went to the leadership summit that was offered through our church, and I, I really uh, was able to hear from uh, a bunch of different people uh, who gave um, an amazing message. And uh, the, uh, the message, they kept saying it was like drinking from a fire hose. You're just taking it in and taking it in and taking it in. Uh, but there was a lot of things that really stood out that are applicable uh, to things that are going to be stated tonight, but also, I think, in good news going forward. And one of those really related right to this teaching team. Um, the idea, the idea simply, that we, as different people, can speak a little differently because we have different experiences. So there was a man by the name of David Livermore, and he was talking about cultural differences, and he was talking about how pastors from different parts of the world see things just a little different. And he was saying that there was a study that was done where they asked pastors from different areas of the world about the prodigal son, the parable of the lost son. And they said, uh, the question that they posed was, how is it that the prodigal son or the lost son ended up where he was at? They first started with a pastor, actually a group of pastors in Russia. And the Russian pastors, uh, what they said was that the prodigal son ended up where he was at because there was a famine in the land. And that's why he ended up where he was, lost from his father, actually in a worse place than the servants uh, that his father employed. And then they talked to some pastors, and I think it was Tanzania. And they said, why in the world did the prodigal son end up where he ended up? And they said, it's because nobody helped him. Nobody fed him. No one gave him anything. And then they asked the pastors in the United States, who we know all had it figured out, and they said, what happened to the prodigal son? And they said that the prodigal son ended up where he was at because he squandered his wealth. And what's interesting is that Scripture is super clear on this. Uh, scripture doesn't really mince words. And here's what it said. It said, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. He set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. And I love this is what David Livermore said. He said the American pastor obviously had it figured out because... He squandered his wealth. But it went on to say, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. And so maybe the Russian pastors had it figured out. And then it went on to say, so he went and hired himself out to the citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So honestly, the, the pastors in Tanzania also had it figured out. They each had a different perspective. And so again, I'm here today to just offer a perspective. I'm grateful for this opportunity. I'm grateful for you being here today. Uh, it's something I've been praying for and we've been praying for as a whole that we believe we are all here for a purpose tonight and excited to, to uh, deliver this message. So we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount over the last uh, really weeks of the summer. So if you've been with us here at Good News, uh, you've been hearing different parts of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, what, the way we've kind of thought about this is it's, it's been entitled Life on the Rocks. Uh, it's God's call on our life to live like the man who built his house on the rock, on the solid foundation. But what's so hard about the Sermon on the Mount is the idea that there's amazing teaching that comes out of it, but it seems so absolutely difficult and actually almost worrisome in some ways in the fact that it's a call that seems almost impossible. Because Jesus, the king, is giving the king's sermon. He's telling us how life should be, and there's amazing teaching there, but it's hard. It's so hard to take what we experience in life, what we actually go through in life, and to match it up with what's in the Sermon on the Mount. And so, as we've been going through this summer, we've been taking those passages one by one, and they are offensive and they are difficult to hear, but they're so absolutely true. 
And tonight's, uh, tonight's message is really no less offensive. It's no less difficult to hear. But it's something that we believe because Jesus believed this is the way that we want to live. That we need to hear this and we need to hear what God is saying to us, what Jesus is saying to us even 2,000 years after this message was given. We as a church, again, believe in reading the scriptures here together. And so uh, over the next minute or so, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, I would ask that you would turn, the, turn to chapter 6 in Matthew. So Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be reading verses 25 to 34. Now, as you know, we as a church move from the, from the conference grounds here, and we go back to the church, and we come back here, and we move back and forth. I was told right before the service, we have one Bible that made the transition from the church moving here today. So, if you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to make it super awkward with someone near you who has a Bible. Just go up to them and look over their shoulder. Or you could just turn on your phones or listen to me here as we read. So would you please stand with me? We're going to be reading again from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. Starting in 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we wear for the pagans or what shall we drink? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Would you please pray with me in response to God's word? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be here tonight uh, for the chance to just hear your word. Uh, we've been led into worship uh, through singing, Lord. Uh, it's a way of touching our hearts and connecting our minds with our hearts. But Lord, as we hear your word and we hear exactly what it is that your son Jesus stated to us in his sermon, Lord, uh, we just can't help but think, Lord, how do we do this? And so, Lord, as we hear tonight uh, just from you, Lord, we ask that you would, you would touch our minds, that you would touch our hearts, that you would connect those things so that your kingdom, Lord, will come here on this earth. We pray all this. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. If you know me at all, uh, you know that uh, uh, I'm someone who came from a wrestling background. As I grew up, that was a big part of my life up until I was about 24 or 25 years old. And so while you're already sort of bearing with me as a, a non-pastor in a teaching role up here today, I'm going to ask you to bear with me just a little farther, and I'm going to talk about basketball which is kind of the rival sport of wrestling. But as I was preparing for the sermon uh, here uh, over the last couple of months, um, I began to listen to different things and trying to make connections to uh, what the scripture was saying and what the story was saying. And so I'm going to start really far out. I'm going to start with basketball. I'm going to bring it to America. And then I'm actually going to bring it to right across the street, a place that I've worked here for the last 11 years, and then hopefully bring it uh, individually to you. And so that's kind of where we're going here today. Um, as I was hearing, I listened actually to a, a podcast by the man of name of uh, Malcolm Gladwell. And uh, he's an author. He writes lots of different books. He also has a podcast uh, that he calls Revisionist History. And what he does is he takes stories of humans, and he looks at them from a little bit of a different angle. Uh, he really brings to life stories we think we knew, uh, and he puts a different spin, not necessarily an untruth, but bringing something to life that maybe we didn't know before. 
It's not a Christian or a, or a kingdom gospel-centered uh, sort of a podcast, but it is super interesting, and I think it always makes sense a lot of times. God knew what he was talking about because he created us, and anytime we can hear about the human condition and who we are, that's super relevant. So he was doing a podcast on basketball, and actually he was uh, referring to someone who was considered a goat at his time. Now, if you don't know what goat is, I had to actually look this up uh, back in the spring. Uh, they were talking about who's the goat. Is it LeBron? Is it Michael? Is it Magic? And I was like, why are they talking about these basketball players as goats? And I had to actually Google, what does goat mean? Well, it stands for greatest of all time. Greatest of all time. So there was a big debate about who was the greatest of all time. Well, before Magic and Michael and uh, LeBron came along, there was a man by the name of Wilt Chamberlain. And Wilt Chamberlain played back a lot of them in the 1960s and 70s, and, and he was a seven-foot-one basketball player. At a time, actually in the 60s, there was at one point only nine basketball teams. He was only one of three who was over seven foot tall. Uh, but that wasn't the only reason that he was great. Height obviously helps. Uh, he was quick. He was fast. He shot well from the field, which if you don't know what that means, that's the place where people are guarding you and they're trying to stop you from shooting in the basketball hoop. Uh, he shot very well from the field. But Wilt Chamberlain, though he was one of the greatest scorers of all time, he's probably considered one of the top 10 basketball players of, time, of all time, he had a weakness. Uh, he could not shoot uh, very well when nobody was guarding him, which to me as a wrestler doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You would think when people are guarding you and trying to prevent you from shooting into the hoop that it would be harder to make a basket than when you take a free throw and you have the opportunity to shoot when absolutely nobody is guarding you. You see, Will Chamberlain shot like 55% from the free throw or from the field over his career, but he was around a 50% shooter uh, over his career when no one was guarding him. But there was a time when he actually began to improve in his ability to make a free throw. You see, his weakness was he couldn't shoot a free throw. So people, if they fouled him, it was like kind of the only way to slow him down. Put him on the line, he would take a shot, maybe he would miss it, a 50% chance, and you get the ball back. So if he could shore up that weakness, it would improve on their team's ability to play and obviously his scoring ability. So in the 1961-62 season, he said, I need to make a change. I need to learn how to shoot free throws so that I can improve. And he was very fortunate to have a teammate by the name of Rick Barry. Now, Rick Barry, when he retired in 1980, was considered the greatest free throw shooter of all time. He shot almost 90%, uh, almost 89.4%, like I believe, was his, his career average. And Rick Barry was intense. He was all about winning within the rules of the game, and he was going to do anything he could to help Wilt be able to shoot free throws. Now, in March of 1962, Wilt Chamberlain had the best free throw shooting game of his life. He made 28 out of 32 free throws. No one's ever scored 28 free throws in that game. In fact, that was the game, if you know basketball history at all, where he scored 100 points in a game. He was almost 90% from the line and shooting those free throws. Now, Rick Barry's technique was extremely interesting. It was actually the way that I learned to shoot. See, when I learned to shoot a basketball, that 10-foot high hoop was extremely high for a youngin who was five years old and trying to get the ball up there. And even though I was trying to muster the strength to get it up to that 10-foot spot, I couldn't do it. So what would you do if you couldn't get it up there? You would find another way. I would go like this, and I would launch the ball into the hoop. Now what's interesting about Rick Barry's technique is he shot exactly like this from the free throw line. 89.4% free throw shooter he was over his entire career. What do we call this kind of style? That's right, it's a granny shot. <laughs> it's not a real flattering name. You see, in that Revisionist History podcast, what he talked about was the fact that Wilt Chamberlain, when he scored 100 points, those 28 free throws that he made were just like this, all in a granny style. It was the way Rick Barry shot his entire career. In that 1961-62 season, he shot 10% better, almost 60% from the free throw line. And you would think that naturally he would continue in that realm. 
he would continue to shoot that way because it's the preferable way. He's making shots and he's getting better, an unstoppable player. But he didn't. After that season, he went right back to shooting like this. His free throw average went down. And again, a still an amazing player, but he may not have reached his full capacity. So again, when you think about this, what's interesting to me is the fact that he knew exactly what he was supposed to do, but to live it out was so terribly difficult. See, Rick Barry was able to do it because he was so unique. He just didn't care. He was one of those guys that a lot of people didn't like. Uh, he just told it as it was. He did things as it was. He was just going to do the best he could and kind of go with tunnel vision. But most of us are social creatures and we care a lot about what other people think. See, Wilt was influenced just like a lot of us were or would be. We're influenced by the people around us. Our behavior is influenced by the things that are around us. So in thinking of today's scripture, the idea of do not worry. Do not worry. That's what Jesus starts with. It's what he continues with. It's what he talks about in this scripture teaching. It's kind of that head knowledge. Jesus is telling us we're not to worry about what this world and what it has to offer. We're not supposed to worry about the needs that we have. We're not supposed to worry about these things that we are just, again, constantly kind of churning in our minds. But yet we know it, but it's so extremely difficult to do. You see, I was hearing, I was listening uh, to another man who was teaching a little bit on worry and anxiety and actually was talking about it in the context of America. Uh, the guy's name was Clay Scroggins, and he's a, he's a pastor in a, uh, a church in the Atlanta area. And what he was saying was that in the United States of America, we are an extremely worrisome and anxious culture. Over the last 80 years, there was a study that's been done talking about and, and really looking into the anxiousness and the worrisome level of people in our country. And each of the last 80 years, our society, our culture has grown more and more worrisome, more and more anxious. What's even more telling is the idea that a lot of people around the world want to immigrate, they want to move to the United States, and there's a ton of advantages uh, for people when they come to the United States. But there is one disadvantage. People who move to the United States naturally become more anxious, more worrisome after living here. It's a part of our culture. It's a part of who we are. It's a part of the environment in which we live. The idea that any of us could think that worry is not something that we have to worry about uh, is actually kind of strange. We are immersed. It's just something that we are a part of. And so when I was kind of reflecting on this idea of, of worry and how is it, how is it that we can kind of overcome what Jesus is telling us, I began to think, what is it that's causing worry? What is it that's causing us to be such a worrisome and anxious environment? And so kind of bringing it back just a little bit closer to home. Again, I've worked as the middle school principal here right across the street for the last 11 years. And last year, we had the opportunity to do something that's completely different and maybe one of the favorite things I've ever been uh, able to be a part of. Uh, we started something called High Five Fridays. High Five Fridays. And so every single Friday, right out front out here, we would have music players that's going on. Uh, we would have our staff that are out there. We invited different groups to come in. Uh, we had firemen coming in. They had their fire trucks blaring uh, the lights. Uh, they were singing the YMCA um, with us as, as, uh, as the kids were coming in. But it was just a really cool experience. Uh, but as the year went on, uh, as the year progressed, uh, one of the things that really stuck out to me was the fact that so many kids were struggling to be able to actually give a high five. You see, as these students were coming in each day, um, they had a whole number of things uh, that they were carrying. So if I'm a middle school student, this is something that a lot of them would actually look like. Now, they would walk in, and we would be trying to give high fives, and most of them, they wanted to do the best they could, but there's about a six-minute period that the six buses come, and 260 kids would come through the door during that time. So these students... They were just moving. They were just moving. They were coming right through. We might give a little bit of an elbow push. We might be patting them on the back. But they were struggling to be able to actually give us a five. 
when this really hit me, because it wasn't such a big deal for us as staff members of different people to say, hey, it's okay, we'll just pat you on the back. But there was actually a student one day, you know those hand flappy things, those the hand clappers that they have a plastic hand and then they have two of them that are on either side and they make a clappy noise. They had actually somehow attached them to the tops of their backpack shoulders. And so these hand flappy things were sticking up off the top of their shoulders and they were walking in so we could give them a high five sticking up. And that student was looking up, he was smiling, he was happy about it, he was excited. But it struck me that these students can't even give a high five. Now, in thinking about the expectations, kind of the culture that we have, I began to think, how in the world, how in the world does this really develop? Again, middle school is one of those times, it's one of the most formative times in our lives. And I think of all the expectations that these students have and what they're carrying in with them. You know, if I'm up here right now, these things are very, very representative. Um, on my right hand over here, I've got a saxophone. Uh, a lot of our students are involved in music and those kind of things. And in my backpack, you know, what's unique about backpacks now is they don't carry books as much anymore. They might have a novel or something like that if a student has a free reading book, but do you know what's inside of a, of a student's backpack these days? Any guesses? You know, the computer could be, but actually that's a separate thing right here. That's a little computer bag. Most of the stuff inside of their bag, a lot of times, is clothes. Um, they're involved in a lot of different activities. There's PE clothes that they're going to have in there, so they need a change of clothes for that. They also need a change of clothes for an activity uh, that they may be involved with after school. A lot of students are also bringing a basketball or they're bringing a football or they're bringing something that they want to use um, when they have uh, recess time or after school. And again, the textbook of today is really, this is a computer bag. And so these students, uh, this is what they're bringing to the table. Now, it's hopeful that they don't have a project that they're working on. It's kind of silly sometimes because we'll have a, a student that's walking in like this and then the parents following right behind them. This isn't a bad thing, but they're bringing the student's project, you know, the trifold boards or those kind of things. So sometimes the students honestly need assistance just to get into the school. The idea that we as a society have expectations on ourselves, on people, um, starts it starts in school, it starts in what we expect of students. It's amazing that our students even can get through a day. Uh, there's a lot of expectations. You know, all of us grew up in worlds where we had lots of classes and we had lots of expectations. Uh, but as we grow, the expectations change. We might put down the saxophone, uh, we might put down the backpack and the basketball, and you know, we didn't have computers growing up when we went to school, but you can substitute something else. But what is it that you've picked up? What is it that you've picked up that's causing you worry? We each have things that worry us. Is it the finances that you just can't make ends meet? Is it the relationship struggle you're having with your spouse or a family member? Is it the work expectations because you can't keep up with the expectations of what is put on you from work day to day? This idea here I think can be summarized a lot of times in thinking like this. If I don't fill in the blank, there's a fear that something won't happen. So if I don't, you fill in the blank, then this won't happen. There's a fear that if I don't keep holding these things, if I don't keep going with them, that the expectations I have for my life, that it just won't get under control. And so what God is calling us to, I think, is something very, very different. So I'm going to put these down for just a second, and I'm going to open up my Bible, and I'm going to talk to what I think God is saying in this whole, in this whole chapter, or in this whole verse series. In verse 33, he talks about worry all up to this point, and he says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So I guess the challenge and the, and the invitation that I have for you today is, is, is this. Each of us is carrying something. Each of us is carrying expectations for our life. We're carrying burdens. We're carrying things that are causing us to worry. The idea, though, of seeking God first, seeking God first is so 
so, so countercultural. It's hard to do this. In fact, when Brandon asked me, this was back at the end of May, he said, Ryan, would you be willing to teach? Would you be willing to do this? I'm going to give you all this time. Here's the verse you're going to teach on. The first thing I told him was no. I remember emailing him back. It was the end of, of the school year. I'm actually transitioning into a new role. And I'd been working and working and working, and I thought, there's no way. I was too worried that it would just take up my summer. It would take up these things. And then a week later, I read the verse, and it said, do not worry, and do not worry, and do not worry. And I, I emailed Brandon back, and I said, Brandon, I think I'll teach. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, it, it's one of those things where I was so consumed with work. I was so consumed with all the expectations I was putting on myself. I couldn't even have time to, to take a break and accept an invitation to do something like this. And so I don't think I'm a whole lot different than a lot of you. We all have those, those things that are in us. Um, a couple practical things that I want to leave you with um, is the idea, and Brandon actually started to touch, this, a touch on this last week, is that we need to take the time to seek. The idea of rest, the idea of Sabbath, um, is one practical spiritual tool that we can use in order to move this way. Our church went through a pretty tremendous series uh, a number of years ago um, by the man of name of Peter Scazzaro. Uh, and he wrote a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. He has a podcast called uh, Emotional Healthy Leadership. But he talks a lot about putting the things down of our life and taking those Sabbath rests. Taking those rests once a week where you take a day and you put down the things of your life and you say, you know what? I'm a limited creature. I'm somebody who doesn't have to control it all, and I'm going to give this up to God. And it's not just on a Sunday or a Saturday or whatever day it is that you pick, but also taking some time on a daily basis. The question, I guess, that I pose for you is whatever these things that you have, that you're holding, that you're carrying, can you put one down? Can you put maybe all of them down for just a short amount of time? That's the challenge. That's the invitation here today. I would like you to try to take a step forward in that because that's what God's calling us to. That's what Jesus in his sermon uh, is saying. Seek first the kingdom of God and all this will be given to you.